Good morning, church. Would you stand as we begin to worship this morning? And there is no one like our God. I hope that you are ready to continue worshiping our incredible God this morning. And if you are a guest with us today, I just want to stop real quick to say welcome. We are so glad that you're here. We're so honored by your presence. And I want to invite you after the service to stop out at the Welcome Center and meet some people there. They would love to give you a gift uh, as well as meet you. If you're joining us online, welcome. Click that new here button if you're new with us online. Thank you so much for joining us. Man, I love that we get to celebrate who our God is together. And let's, let's lift our voices this morning. Let's magnify who our God is as we continue to worship him this morning. Oh, 
time and time again You have proven You do just what you say Though the storms may come And the winds may blow I remain steadfast And let my heart learn It will come to pass Come on, sing greatest Great is your faith
Come on, would you give him praise? Thank him for his faithfulness. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning, Cross Point. It is so good to uh, see you guys. I uh, got to greet a lot of people that I haven't seen for a little while, and so uh, just uh, it's good to see you guys. And uh, man, these last couple of weeks really encouraging for uh, our team uh, to look around the room and see a lot of faces back and the, lot of the room a lot more full. And uh, just uh, it's really encouraging and excited about what God's going to continue to do around here and where he's headed in the future. So last week, uh, we talked about the reality that uh, detours are going to pop up in our lives, aren't they? Right? A, an interruption to life, a surprise, and whether that is a, a sickness or a financial setback or a broken relationship or a cancellation or some kind of surprise announcement, we cannot avoid these detours that seem to pop up in life. And so the question that we're trying to answer is, when they pop up, will I continue to trust God? Or maybe we ask the question this way, do I see God as big enough to help me walk through the detour? And we, uh, Gideon and his story last week helped us to be reminded of this important principle, that if God is with me, that you have everything you need to move boldly forward. If God is with you, you have everything you need to move boldly forward. That's true for us as individuals, and it's true for us as a church as we move forward into the future. And so we're doing some things between now and the end of this calendar year to help us as a church be reminded that God is indeed with us, right? We're doing three things. We're praying every day at 2.04, and if you weren't with us last week and you want to set an alarm on your phone, encourage you to do that. And every day at 2.04, wherever we are, we're just trying to take a few seconds and ask God to remind us that he is with us. Secondly, uh, we're fasting. One meal or one day each week between now and the end of the year, and using that time to pray, and using that time, again, to be reminded that God is indeed with us. And then we're asking God what kind of maybe generous or even extravagant gift we might give between now and the end of the year to help us move forward. And we'll talk a little bit more about why we're doing that piece this morning. So I want to continue today, though, to talk about how to move boldly forward when these detours pop up in our lives. And today I want to talk about something that uh, is a reason it becomes a big obstacle sometimes in our lives that keeps us from moving forward when these detours pop up. And this thing that often gets in our way, it may surprise you, right? Because this thing that often gets in the way becomes a source of security for us. In fact, sometimes we seem to put our trust in this thing more than we do in God. In fact, this thing sometimes seems to act as an insurance policy for us, that I, as long as I know I've got this, then I can make it through the detours. And Jesus one day was uh, talking with his disciples, he was teaching, and he told a story about a guy who I think seemed to put all of his, he was putting his hope in this thing instead of putting his hope in God. Here's how Jesus said, he said, there was this farmer who had an abundant crop one year, like overwhelmingly abundant. And it was so much that he didn't have room to store it all. And so he wondered, what do I do? He said, I know, I'll tear down the barns that I have and I'll build bigger ones. I'll go get a, a storage unit or two or three, right? Well, I'll uh, pour all of this into my retirement, what might be the modern day equivalents. And so he tears down these old barns and he builds bigger ones. And then he says, now, now I can eat and rest and be merry. And I think in part he's saying, you know what? I don't have to worry about the future. I'm not concerned about what detours might pop up because I've got all of this, these money and these possessions, and they'll help me to get through the detour. 
But at the end of that, Jesus offered this warning in Luke chapter 12. He said, yes, a person is a fool to store up earthly wealth, but not have a rich relationship with God. See, here's what money and possessions can do for us if we're not careful. They can become the answer for us in how to deal with the detours that pop up in life instead of putting our trust in God. And for many of us, if we're not careful, the phrase for us begins to be this, if money is with me, then I have everything I need to move boldly forward. And we replace that trust in God with putting our trust in money. We think we can buy our way through the detours instead of placing our trust in God. Now, listen, hear me right up front say these three things. I am not this morning suggesting in any way that money is evil. I am not suggesting that there's anything wrong with having money or nice things. And I am not suggesting that we should not prepare for the future. In fact, the Bible teaches throughout the Psalms and Proverbs, especially and in other places, that you and I ought to prepare. We ought to be thinking about the future. We ought to save for those detours that might pop up, right? And, and we ought to be wise managers or stewards of the money that God has given us. Right? I mean, Peg and I do that. Uh, it was just a month ago that suddenly I found myself in the hospital overnight, some surgery to take my gallbladder out and kind of an emergency deal. And just a couple of weeks ago, I got the bill for that. <laughs> right? And of course, there was the normal game between the hospital and the insurance. They jacked the price up so they could get money from the insurance company. Then they wrote off a bunch of it. And I have good health insurance. Thank you that I have good health insurance. But you know what? I still owed several thousand dollars. But Peg and I try to manage our resources. We're not perfect at it, but we try to manage them wisely. We have money in a savings account, right? And so I was able to just write that check and take care of it because we've tried to be wise stewards. But there is a huge difference between being a wise manager of our resources and putting our trust in our money. Notice Jesus here, he doesn't say that it is wrong to store up but he says, we've got it all backwards as suddenly we're putting our trust in our money instead of putting our trust in God. We're getting it mixed up if we trust money instead of having a rich relationship with God. In fact, another time Jesus was teaching on this very same principle and he said this in Matthew chapter six, the words are recorded. He says, do not store up for yourself treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and still. In other words, don't set, store up treasures because they're not going to last here. Right? They don't last forever. He says, but store up for yourself treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. Store up for yourself treasures that are going to last. For he says, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And then a couple verses later, he goes on to say this, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Jesus says, you can't have two masters. You can't put your trust in two different things. You can't put your trust in God and put your trust in money. You can't find security in money and find security in God. But you see, I'm, I'm afraid that for many of us, we have sort of bought into this, really it's a lie from Satan, that says, well, if I have money, then I can have control in an uncontrollable world. If I have money and a detour pops up, then I can just buy my way through it. I don't have to really worry about trusting God. But Jesus said that is a false sense of security. It's a false sense of security because, well, money doesn't last. Right? We all know, right? As quickly as it appears, it can disappear, can't it? Just think what's going on with the inflation right now. Suddenly, a lot of your money is disappearing, isn't it? It's also a false sense of security because, Money cannot prevent the detours from popping up. Money doesn't prevent cancer or suddenly having to go to the surgery for gallbladder surgery, the hospital for gallbladder surgery. 
right? And, and I'm pretty sure that just as many rich people as poor people have gotten COVID, right? And money doesn't prevent divorce, and it doesn't stop you from being in an accident. It doesn't prevent anything. Money is a false sense of security because you can't buy your way into heaven. When Jesus comes back again and he is ready to welcome people into heaven, he is not going to have any interest in how much money you have accumulated in your bank account. All he's going to be interested in is whether or not you decided to follow him as your savior and whether or not you're putting your trust in him and finding your security in him. In other words, have you been willing to make him the leader of your life? I think there's another way that Jesus talks about that sort of is a false sense of security that money does for us. See, in these, where Jesus teaches these words about you can't serve two masters, in the very next paragraph, you know what he talks about? He talks about worry. And it is not the only place in Scripture that Jesus seems to link together these two things, worry and money. And I don't think it is a stretch to realize that Jesus, I think, is suggesting that money actually causes worry in our lives. He says, don't worry about the food on your table or a roof over your head or clothes, all the things that money buys. And don't worry about tomorrow. If a detour is going to pop up, you just put your trust in me. But that's hard for us to do, isn't it, in a culture, in the culture that we live in. Because we live in a culture that says to us in so many different ways, in so many loud voices, that money is where it's at. And if you've got money, put your trust in that. Because that'll get you through the detour. So what do we do as followers of Jesus? How do we How do we make sure we're not trying to serve two masters? How do we make sure we're not putting our trust in our money instead of really putting our trust in God? I I think Jesus gives us the answer in the verses that we already read. Let's look at those again, the first couple of verses. He says, do not store up treasures for yourself, treasures on earth, where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. Instead, he says, but store up for yourself treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. And then here, I think, is the important line. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Right? Jesus says, where your treasure is, that's where your heart will be. Now, here's the thing. In our lives so many times, and I think in our culture, we think the opposite. And we act the opposite. We think where our heart is, that's where our treasure will be. And that's the way some people live, right? The way they choose to spend their money is dependent on where their heart is. They follow their emotions. And wherever their emotions take them, that's where they invest their resources. And that oftentimes is how money becomes the thing that we trust in. But Jesus says that if we're going to live by the principle that if God is with us, you have everything you need to move boldly forward. If you're going to put your trust in God rather than your money, then it's got to be treasure first and then heart. Right? And that's, we live that way also at times. Think about it. I can remember when our kids were really little, if I bought new clothes, like maybe a new shirt, I was not like, hey, just come climb on top of daddy, right? If I had that brand new shirt on, I was like, let's inspect your hands. Let's inspect your mouth. Right? If you just ate, let's get a burp rag. Right? Like you're not destroying my brand new shirt, right? Because I had invested in it and my heart was saying, take care of it. Same way for a lot of you when you get a new car. For months, when you get a new car, no one is allowed to have any food or drink in that vehicle, are they? (laughs) because you've, that you've invested your treasure in it, and so your heart has followed. The, the reverse happens sometimes. I, I know for me, if somebody gives me tickets to a, like a sporting event, and I go to that game and it's a blowout, I think, man, I'll just go home. I didn't pay for the tickets. I'm not invested in it. But if I bought the ticket, especially what it costs to go to some sporting events, I'm staying no matter what happens to the very bitter end, right? Because treasure first, then heart. We love around here at Cross Point to help people go to counseling when they need it, right? And we'll, we'll help pay for that sometimes because it's that important to us. But most of the time, if they can pay something, 
We ask them to contribute on their own. Why? Because then they've made an investment in it. Treasure first, then heart. Because if they've got a financial investment in it, they'll probably take it more seriously and do the work that is necessary to have the right outcome. It's treasure and then heart. And if that's true, right, if we're going to do treasure then heart, and here's why this matters. It's treasure then heart for us as followers of Jesus. And that means then that I need to be investing my resources, my possessions, my things in stuff that matters for eternity, things that are about the kingdom of God, because then my heart will follow, and I'll be much more likely to make sure that I have put my trust in God instead of in my money. Now, how do we do that? Well, I think the Bible talks about three things, three things that we ought to do in our lives that will help us to make sure we're doing treasure first and then our heart follows. The first of these things that the Bible talks about that we ought to do is to practice priority generosity. To practice priority generosity. You give to the most important things in your life first. Again, for a lot of us, this is not uncommon. We we do this with a lot of different kinds of things in life. We make choices about what matters to us the most. That's why sometimes people look at the way that you spend money and think, why do you spend your money that way? Right? Because you've invested in what matters to you most first. I know I've, I've told this before, Peg and I, for years when we lived in our house, we, uh, we had a kitchen that was so out of date. Like it was functional, but it was ugly. Right, and we tried to do some cheap cosmetic things to make it look a little bit better, but there was no way around it. It was just ugly. Right, and so a lot of people would have said, well, why don't you invest the money to fix your kitchen up? Well, we didn't want to invest that money because you know what was more important to us? Being able to take a vacation with our kids every year and build family memories. And so we kept doing that every year and lived with an ugly kitchen until the kids moved out. <laughs> then we got it fixed. Right? And so we have those kinds of things, and the Bible teaches that when it, as a follower of Jesus, I need to make sure that I'm investing in things that matter for eternity first, that I put those above everything else to make sure that that's where my heart goes first so that I'm making sure even in the way that I handle my money, I'm teaching myself that it's God first. I'm placing my trust in him. And so a follower of Jesus, before I pay my house payment or my car payment or I put food on the table, or certainly before I worry about paying for all the streaming services that you have and I have, I had to invest first in God's kingdom through the local church so that I'm putting him first in my finances. And I'm modeling that it's treasure first in the kingdom of God so that my heart follows that. Second thing, Second thing is to practice percentage generosity. Percentage generosity. You give by a percentage rather than a set amount. And why does that matter? Well, because the reality is as life goes along, our income, the amount of money that we have, ebbs and flows, doesn't it? And you would think that the more we have, the more generous we would be, but that's not necessarily true. In fact, statistics show here in America that people who make a household income of $50,000, they, in general, give about 6% of their income away. They practice generosity either to their church or other things to the tune of about 6%. Now, when you think that as the income for people grows, that they would just naturally give a larger percentage away, but that's not the reality. The statistics show that a person who makes a household income of $200,000 just gives 4% away to others. And why is that? Because they've practiced giving some certain set amount away instead of practicing a percentage. And then Jesus affirmed a principle of the Old Testament. That the Jews in the Old Testament, God asked them to give 10% of their income back to him. And I think, again, it was that same principle, treasure first, then heart. And Jesus affirmed this principle in the New Testament for followers today. And it, I think it's based on the idea that that way, no matter how big our income gets, we're giving that same proportion away so that it's treasure first and then heart. There's a moment in the 
New Testament where Jesus with some of his disciples in the temple and there is a woman, right? I think maybe a single mom who comes and she, she puts in uh, two copper coins. I mean, it's a really small amount of money. I don't know what it would equate to today, a couple of dollars maybe or a few cents. And then there's a, a rich guy right after who comes and puts into the offering a large sum of money. And Jesus says in that moment that the woman who gave a little bit has given more than the man who gave from his riches. And why? Because she gave proportionally a percentage that was greater, a greater sacrifice. She was putting her treasure so that her heart would follow. She was putting God first in that part of her life as a reminder that my trust is not in my money. My trust is in God. The third thing, then, that we ought to practice is progressive generosity. That's what it is. All these P's get me. The third thing is progressive generosity. Have you noticed this in our culture? A lot of people will say, oh, yeah, I'm generous. But very few people say, I'm rich. But the numbers say just the opposite is actually true. You've probably heard these kinds of statistics before that any of us who have a household income of $50,000, which I realize in this room, that's not everyone, but I'm guessing it's a lot of us. Those of us who have a household income of $50,000, we are in the top 0.31% of the richest people in the world, right? Now, I didn't say the top 5% or 10% I'm, or 1%, the top 0.31% of the richest people in the world. We're rich by standards of the world that we live in. But the numbers say we're not as generous as we think we are. Right? And the idea of progressive generosity is that as, my, as I go along in life, I keep growing that percentage that I'm giving back to God. So that as I'm progressing through life and as my faith goes deeper, I'm making sure that I continue to put him first in my finances. That it's not just about a, a percentage that I'm giving, but it's about growing that so that it's always treasure first, then heart. There were uh, some construction workers, this happened a number of years ago in Pompeii, who were uh, digging up the earth, preparing to build something. And as they were doing that, they came across a skeleton. And as they uh, looked in, in the dirt and archaeologists got involved, they realized that it seemed like this woman had been fleeing the eruption of the volcano in Pompeii years and years earlier. And what was interesting is that they found, as they, they dug up the skeleton, that clutched in her hands were jewels. And she is holding on to them. And you just have to wonder... Like, we don't know this part of the story, but you have to wonder, she was clutching on to these jewels which were in perfect condition, valuable. Did she, did she linger a little too long in her home trying to gather up these jewels? Did, did she start to run away one day and then think, no, 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 I've got to have these jewels, they're so important to me, and go back and grab them? And is that why she couldn't get away from the river of lava that caught up with her and buried her there? But it's also such a clear reminder, isn't it? that all the stuff that we accumulate in this life, the stuff of earth, it eventually will disappear. It goes away. Only the investment that we've made in the things that matter for eternity into God's kingdom will matter in eternity. J Jim Elliott, who's a missionary, who was martyred because of his faith, he wrote these words. He says, a person is no fool to give away what he cannot keep in order to gain what he cannot lose. Friends, this is part of the reason that through this series, as we're trying to think about the detours that pop up in our life and making sure that we're functioning from the principle that if God is with us, then we have everything we need to move boldly forward. That's the reason we put this financial component in it. And so I'm hoping that you will continue to consider between now and the end of the year what kind of generous, maybe even extravagant gift that you would give because here's, here's the reason in part. Because there's something that happens in our hearts when we join together and we step out in faith with our finances, right? Where we give gifts sometimes that we think, I, I don't really know, I don't know where this money is gonna come from or if I take this money out of my savings, what am I gonna do? 
because it's a step of faith. And I know from my own experience that it builds my faith as I watch God replace that money or bless me in other ways, right? Because he works in that way. And there's something about us uniting and doing something like this together that invest in God's kingdom. And we get to see how he moves us forward because of our generosity. And so I'm challenging you to do this financial piece because I just want us, in addition to praying and fasting about the future, I want us to make a financial investment in the future that reminds us that my trust is not in my money, my security is not in my money, that my trust, my security, my insurance, if you will, is completely in God. Right, and so as we said last week, you can do that anytime between now and the end of the year. You can select the forward fund on our giving platforms. You can write forward on the memo of your check. And we're just going to hold all of that money together. And then we're going to make one large payment on the principal of our loan, which is going to lower our interest rate and save us thousands of dollars and help us to move boldly forward into the future. Listen, friends, detours are going to continue to pop up in your life. And as I said last week, you may have one this week. A lot of us may have one this week. And in that moment, you have to choose. Am I going to trust God? Or am I going to try to trust something else to help me navigate through that? Please, let's be, let's be reminded together that if God is with you, you have everything you need to move boldly forward. Let's make sure that we serve Him as our master and we don't try to serve any other master in our life. Listen, if you have not yet made the choice to follow Jesus, then that's the first step. Because until you begin to follow Jesus, you let him be the savior of your life, you let him be the leader of your life, you're, you're putting your trust and your eternal future in the hands of other things. And you will find that there's an emptiness to that. But when you begin to follow Jesus and you experience the forgiveness of your sins and the Holy Spirit comes and begins to live in your life, and you have the hope of eternal life, there is, your life becomes full because you're no longer trusting in you and what you can do, but you're trusting in the creator to walk with you through life. If you've not yet made that decision to follow Jesus, to publicly demonstrate that by being baptized, immersed in water, when we wrap up our service, several of us will be down here in the front. We would love to have a conversation with you about how you could begin to follow Jesus today. It will change your life and it will change your eternity. Let's pray together. God, I, we want to be people. I think all of us in this room, we, we want to be people who are putting our trust in you rather than putting our trust in anything else. But God, we acknowledge to you today that that's really difficult for us in the culture that we live in because our culture just screams so loudly sometimes that we need money and that that's, that's what gets us through things. So God, would you teach us how to be wise managers, wise stewards of the things that you've given us? God, help us to know how to prepare for the future financially. But God, would you help us to make sure that we live in a way that it is treasure first and then heart. And that God, if we're trying to serve two masters, you'd help us to see that in our lives. And God, I pray for every person in this room or watching online this morning that maybe needs to make a decision to follow Jesus, that you prompt them in their heart to have that conversation, to reach out this morning and have that conversation so that they could begin to follow you. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your love. Thank you for being the God who gives us strength and provides for us to be able to move forward in life. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I invite you to stand as we sing this last song together. Every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever bring And we live for you We live for you, Jesus Jesus, the name above every other name Jesus, the only one who could ever say, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, and we live for you, we live for you, sing that. 
Yesterday I had to go up to Spring Hill to do one of my least favorite things in the world, and that's painting. I, I don't really hate many things, but I, I hate painting. I just do. I don't know why. I just hate it. But on the way up, um, I remembered like there was going to be a SpaceX launch yesterday from Cape Canaveral, and, I, and that's like one thing that I absolutely love. So I thought, well, I'm leaving early, so I'll just like, I'll time it right. So I timed it to where I got to the base of the Skyway Bridge. And beautiful morning, nice cool weather, the sun's coming up. And when I get there, like, there are two dolphins just playing around, searching for food, like, right at the guardrail. Like, if that rail weren't there, I could have just reached right down and touched them. So I'm standing there enjoying that. And then, like, I get to see a rocket launch, which if you've never done that, it's awesome. It's so cool. I'm just like thinking, you know, like 
it brought me back to what Jesus says in Matthew, where he says, like, if you who are evil know how to give good gifts to each other, like, how much more does your Father who is in heaven know how to give good gifts to you? And I was just reminded of, like, his love for me in having to get up early, do something that I don't really want to do, but, like, I couldn't have asked for a better morning, a better day. And it, it was just such a cool reminder of his love and his grace and his desire to, to give us good things. And I know it's something as simple as just seeing some dolphins like jumping around in the water and having a good time, but it was just such a, a humbling reminder of like God's love for me. And as we come to this time of communion, it's a time for us to be reminded just how much he loves us. I mean, he gave us the greatest gift we could ever imagine. And that is sending his son to die on the cross for our sins, to pay a price, to pay a debt that we could never repay. But because of his love, because of his desire to be in relationship with us, he gave us the gift that we needed. And as, as we eat the bread and we drink the juice, we're reminded of his body that was broken and his blood that was shed as an act of love for us. I'm just gonna give you a moment here to, to just reflect on that in this, this season of thanksgiving to, to thank him and to praise him for his love and his sacrifice. And you can eat and drink those whenever you're ready and I'll be back in just a moment to pray. God, I'm so thankful for those little reminders that point us back to the big picture. God, I'm thankful for your love that, that you were willing to send your son to sacrifice him on a cross so that we could have salvation, so that we could be in relationship with you. God, we're so humbled by your love. We're so thankful for your love. It's in your name we pray. Amen. You can place your empty cups on the floor in front of you and dispose of those as you leave here this morning. Um, one of our partners, one of the, the organizations that we partner with here at Cross Point is Ends of the Earth Cycling. And if you would just check out this video. Yeah. Um, so we got a, we've got an update from Justin Hannikin um, in this video. So if you check that out, we'll get an update from there. Hey, what's going on, Cross Point family? This is Justin Hannikin. My wife, Brandon, and I serve with Ends of the Earth Cycling, Ministry of New International. And I just wanted to reach out to you and thank you for your generous support of our mission. Ends of the Earth Cycling is an active bicycling community impacting youth globally. And I'm coming to you from our sixth cycling tour this year. Today's day three, we get the chance to ride 100 miles for a youth ministry in Nicaragua. I want to let you guys know, through your support of our ministry, you have transformed the lives of youth with the gospel in Romania, in Cambodia, in the Philippines, in Ukraine, in Kenya, and, in, and on this tour in Nicaragua. Through your generous support, our partners around the world have been blessed and youth ministries are flourishing. I want to let you know that this has been a banner year for Ends of the Earth Cycling. We are upwards of $130,000 raised to transform the lives of youth around the world in Jesus' name. Thank you so much for your generous support, for your prayers. Love you, Cross Point family, and can't wait to be back with you in person sometime soon.
Yeah, that's, that's so awesome, and it's because of your faithful and generous giving each and every week that we're able to support organizations like that. Uh, there are multiple ways that you can give. They're on the screen, and I just want to say, if you're a guest with us this morning, please don't feel any pressure or obligation to give. We're just so thankful that you chose to worship with us this morning. Thanks, John. Uh, Hey, I have a save the date for you guys. Uh, On February 11th, we are going to be having our Night to Shine Shine Through event. And if you've ever been part of a Night to Shine event with us before, you know that this is an incredible opportunity for us to serve some of our special needs community and just want to get this date out to you guys so you can get it on your calendar, get it, get it marked on there so you don't forget because you are not, you're not going to want to miss this. You're not going to want to miss getting to be a part of this and serve our community in this way. And actually, volunteer registration opens today, so you can save the date and go ahead, if you'd like to, uh, to go ahead and register in the app to be a part of that, because it's just going to be such, such an amazing event. It's always one of my favorite things that we get to do together as a church to serve this community. We also, after our second service today, uh, are going to have a connect lunch And so if you're uh, registered to join us for that, uh, it's going to be in the student center, which is the building located directly behind me. Uh, If you're not registered and you're like, what is a Connect Lunch? Uh, It's just an opportunity to hear more about who we are as a church and there's free lunch. And so that's awesome. Uh, We do have some extra lunches, so if you're interested uh, in joining us for that, you can uh, talk to them out at the Welcome Center, and the people there would love to talk to you and get you signed up so you can take one of those spots and join us for lunch, and so we'll see you guys after second service. Thank you guys so much for worshiping with us today. Uh, Our prayer team is going to be down in front after the service, and if you have anything that you would like to be prayed for about, we would love to pray with you, or if you'd like somebody to talk to you about your relationship with Jesus, we would love to have that conversation with you, so we'd love to pray with you, so come down front and pray with us. But everybody else, as you guys, well, everyone, (laughs) you're not like excluded if you come get prayed for from this part, that's, you know... um, Everyone, go out this week. Love God, love people, and share Jesus, and we'll see you back next week.